Welcome everyone to this week of Tommy Talks. This week is a great pleasure to have Dr. Kaidi Young. Uh, something about him. So he's currently a postdoctoral scholar uh, at Stanford University working in Autonomous Systems Lab with Marco Pavone. Before that, he obtained a Bachelor of Engineering in Automation and a Bachelor in Pure and Applied Mathematics and a Master in Control Science and Engineering from Tsinghua University. He then moved to Switzerland at ETH Zurich actually where he obtained his PhD degree in 2019, working on uh, transportation. And his uh, main research interests lie in the design of oper and the operations of future mobility systems, utilizing disruptive paradigms. For instance, you can think of uh, connected and automated vehicles or also shared mobility systems. Today, he's gonna talk about uh, some recent work uh, about this operation of autonomous vehicles enabled future mobility systems. And we are all very happy to hear uh, what he's gonna talk about. So go ahead, Kaidi, the stage is yours. Thank you, thank you very, mu very much, Giola. And uh, thank, thanks everyone for, uh, for coming to the seminar. And it is my great pleasure to, to give the seminar, especially coming back to ETH. And I'll be talking about some of our recent works on future mobility systems with a particular focus on autonomous vehicles and mobility on demand systems. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, transportation systems nowadays are facing many challenges, such as congestions and accidents, which may further incur economic losses, increase pollution, or even claim human lives. And on the brighter side, disruptive technologies such as connected and automated vehicles, electric vehicles, shared mobility, and et cetera, have demonstrated enormous potential to improve or innovate the operation of transportation systems. In turn, the need and the development in transportation systems can also influence or define the path for these advances. So my research aims to leverage these advances and develop optimization algorithms for the operation and design of future transportation systems. And specifically, I'm interested in two directions. So in the first direction, I'm interested in the interactions between these uh, technological advances with the existing mobility systems. For example, the interactions between autonomous vehicles and human-driven vehicles, and the interactions between public transport and shared mobility. And second, I'm interested in addressing some of, some of the potential externalities or, or even threats of those advances. For example, um, there are externalities on equity or on the privacy of users. And uh, this talk will be focusing on some of my research on automated vehicles, and which I assume that everyone will be very familiar. So you'll be the vehicles that can of level four, which can drive themselves and uh, uh, this, this transformational technology will certainly have a lot of benefits, and I'll be mainly focusing on the benefits of, uh, of being globally coordinated. And I would further consider a scenario with mixed autonomy, since the capability and the penetration rates of automated vehicles can only increase gradually. And in this transition period, the automated vehicles will be coexisting with not automated vehicles, which is human-driven vehicles. And we all agree that we can drastically improve the performance of the transportation systems if our vehicles are automated. However, it is important how we can reach this ide ideal scenario. We aim to develop some modeling and control techniques to ensure the standard transition towards full autonomy. And for the research of autonomous vehicles, I've been working of the application of autonomous, the mixed autonomy uh, in different transportation systems. For example, mobility and demand systems, um, traffic intersections, um, hi uh, highway weaving sections, and uh, for logistics services. And in today's talk, I'll be mainly focusing on some of, my, uh, some of our works on mobility and demand systems. And mobility and demand services, such as ride sharing, bike sharing and scooter sharing have swept most parts of the world. And it, it is expected that the global market of shared mobility will keep expanding in the next couple of years. And this promising service will certainly improve passenger mobility 
and maximize the resource usage. And a key operational challenge in mobility and demand system is the vehicle imbalances. And after, after vehicles take passengers to their destination, they'll be waiting for new passengers around these regions. And since the traffic demand is typically asymmetric, vehicles tend to accumulate in the destination regions while becoming insufficient in the original regions where passengers make a request. And this would lead to inefficient, inefficient operations of the system and have negative impact on passenger mobility. For example, reducing passenger acceptance rate and increasing passenger waiting time. And there are several uh, types of existing approaches to address this challenge. One approach is to provide global information to drivers, such as a heat map, so that the drivers know where they can get passengers. Another approach is to apply some kind of incentive-based incentive, incentive approaches uh, or search pricing to attract drivers to the regions with vehicle shortage. However, these approaches do not coordinate drivers globally. Drivers will still care about their own interests and may not be interested in traveling a long way with idle vehicles or going to regions with very low benefits. In fact, the drivers might even be gaming with the system to achieve better benefits. For example, some drivers might temporarily log out from the system during peak hours to reduce the supply in that region so that the search price can go up. And after the driver sees the increase of the price, they will log into the system again to achieve a higher earning. And such behavior can certainly be detrimental to the service. And the development of autonomous vehicles would provide unique opportunities for global coordination. And thus it would have the potential to improve the services. As we are able to coordinate autonomous vehicles, we can rebalance them to the regions with vehicle shortage. And however, since the penetration rate of autonomous vehicles cannot only <coughs> can, can only uh, increase gradually, we would consider a scenario with mixed autonomy. And we consider two types of vehicles. Autonomous vehicles that can be globally coordinated but may not be able to operate on certain regions before the technologies become fully mature. And now automated vehicles that can use other roads, but are controlled by human drivers and who care about their own earning. And the system is controlled by an operation center. And this operation center would assign passengers and routes to autonomous vehicles and assign only passengers to non-automated vehicles. And autonomous vehicles would, would take the assigned passengers and follow the assigned routes. However, since the non-autonomous vehicles would act on their own interest, they might not be willing to accept the passengers as assigned to them. For example, if the passengers are going to an area with a very low demand, it is very likely that the drivers will have, have to come back with empty vehicles. And in addition, um, non-autonomous vehicles would also design their own routes, either the routes with passengers or with rebalancing routes when they're idle. And now autonomous, autonomous vehicles will, will also decide whether and when to work. And the complexity of modeling such a system lies in the interactions between autonomous vehicles and non-autonomous vehicles. Um, by interaction, we mean that both types of vehicles would respond to the actions of the other type. And why do autonomous vehicles and non-autonomous vehicles interact with each other? because they collaboratively serve the same set of passengers and may share the same set of roads. And if a passenger is, is taken by autonomous vehicle, it cannot be taken by non-autonomous vehicle anymore. And if too many vehicles are using one road, the road will become very congested. And existing research of such a mixed system either focused on pricing or considered very simple road network. To the best of our knowledge, no existing works have developed control strategies for such a mixed fleet of vehicles in mobility and demand system with a realistic road network. And our goal is to coordinate autonomous vehicles in the real world network, considering the interactions between autonomous vehicles and non-autonomous vehicles. And to this end, we would employ a software game-based framework to approximate such interactions, which is also called the leader follower game. So we treat the operation center as the leader, which would assign the passengers to both types of vehicles and design the routes for autonomous vehicles with an aim to optimize the services. And the follower is the non-autonomous vehicles that aim to optimize earning. 
and they can decide whether or not to take passengers um, and design their own routes. And this framework in, is implemented through a model predictive control. And the leader model is uh, formulated as an optimization problem where the objective function is to maximize the operator's utility, which is defined as the difference between earnings and costs, including the cost of passenger waiting and the cost of operating uh, both non -autom uh, both autonomous, autonomous vehicles and non-autonomous vehicles. And the constraints include the conservation of vehicles, the conservation of passengers, and the behavior models of non-autonomous vehicles, which come from the father model, and the bounds of variables. And the father model is also an optimization problem, uh, which uh, the objective function is a, proxy, is a proxy of the utility of the non-autonomous vehicles. We aim to learn it from the real data. We have also demonstrated um, that the solution of this optimization problem can characterize an equilibrium of the human drivers. And the constraints we consider for the following model are also conservation of vehicles and passengers and bounds of variables. And we would perform a case study inspired by a typical morning in Singapore. So here we are using the data provided by Grab and we keep the total number of vehicles as a constant value and replace non-autonomous vehicles with autonomous vehicles. So here we compare our uh, proposed stalker per game based approach represented by the red lines and with a benchmark algorithm without considering the interactions between autonomous vehicles and non-autonomous vehicles, which is represented by green lines. And the figure on the left shows the improvement of the operator's profits as the penetration rate of the autonomous vehicles increases. And the figure on the right shows the improvement of passenger acceptance rate as the penetration rate of autonomous vehicles increases. And first we can see that as the penetration rate of autonomous vehicles increases, the operator's profit can be improved by up to 400%. And the passenger acceptance rate can be improved by up to 18%. This shows that the deployment of autonomous vehicles can significantly improve the operator, operator's profit and the quality of service. And we next compare our approach with the benchmark approach without considering behavioral interactions between autonomous vehicles and non-autonomous vehicles. So we can see that by considering the behavioral interactions, the operator's profit can be improved by up to 190% and the passenger acceptance rate can be improved by up to 16%. We would also like to highlight the practical significance of this work. So from this operational perspective, autonomous vehicles can also be implemented as a contractor drivers who are paid to strictly follow the instructions given by the system. So this, show, this means that the proposed algorithm has the practical value even before autonomous vehicles are deployed in the market. And so far in this part, we have developed a stalker per game based framework to handle the interactions between autonomous vehicles and non-autonomous vehicles. And this implementation is based on the model predictive control, which involves the solution of a very large scale optimization models. And the solution time of the proposed approach is around uh, 15 seconds for every decision step for the city of Singapore. So if we can want to consider a city with a larger scale, or if we, if we have a higher requirement of the resolution, we will need to resort to some uh, more efficient algorithms. So in this part, we'll look into the deep reinforcement learning based algorithm to devise the efficient uh, algorithms without significantly compromising optimality. And the deep learning can also handle stochasticity which is hard to capture using a theoretical model. And there are very few work on the deep reinforcement learning for mobility and demand system. And the existing works didn't consider, uh, didn't exploit the, the network architecture, which is able to uh, utilize the graph, the graph structure of the transportation networks. So, um, and we, we argue that it is very important to exploit the graph structure in order to achieve better performance. And to this end, we leverage the graph neural network to devise a scalable and clo close to optimal control algorithms. And here we uh, mainly focus 
focus on the rebalancing of the idle vehicles to address the key challenge of the vehicle imbalance of the mobility and demand systems. So we abstract the transportation network to a graph where the nodes represent the pickup, pickup and drop off locations and the edges represent connectivity between nodes. And we would adopt the three-step procedure to improve the scalability of the training and implementation of, of the deep reinforcement learning neural network. And this uh, three-step procedure is actually uh, followed by, uh, by some previous work in your group. And so here, the, fir the first step is the dispatching step that matches the passengers with vehicles. And the second step is the main reinforcement, le reinforcement learning step based on the graph neural network. And the third step is the post-processing step. And the second and the third step together devise policy to rebalance idle vehicles. We'll next look into more details. So in the first step, we match the passengers with drivers based on a simple optimization model that maximizes the operator's profits at, at, at a single decision step. And the constraints are the conservation of passengers and the conservation of vehicles. And the second step is the main reinforcement learning module based on the graph neural network. And this diagram shows the decision process. As at each decision step, this module determines an action based on the system states obtained from the mobility and plan system. And we define the states to include both the current and predicted demand, such as, <coughs> such as <coughs> sorry, and, and the vehicle accumulation and the future arrivals and the prices and the travel times. And for the actions, we define that as the desired vehicle distribution at each uh, region. So here we will have one action for each node as opposed to along each edge in the majority of the literature. So this treatment can significantly improve scalability of the training and the implementation, which is also the reason why we adopt this uh, three-step procedure. And the reward is defined as a profit at each decision step, which will also be used to train this, uh, this neural network. We propose an, uh, an advantage actor critic policy optimization framework based on graph neural networks. And here the actions can, can be directly calc uh, calculated by evaluating this embedded neural network without having to solve any optimization problem. And this ensures that the action can be calculated in a very efficient manner. And we use this A to C framework to stabilize learning. And here we also use this graph neural network to exploit the graph, graph structure of the transportation network. So as illustrated below, uh, this, uh, this graph neural network aggregates both the local information at each node as marked in red and, and the information about the neighboring node as marked in blue to learn an updated representation as marked in green in the figure on the right. And finally, in the third step, the compute, this computed desire vehicle distribution is converted to the rebalancing actions as through a very simple optimization problem. So the objective function is to minimize the rebalancing cost at each decision step, and the constraint is the conservation of vehicles. So here we, we perform a case study inspired by a typical morning in the, uh, in, in the city of Chengdu in China, and we are using the DD data. And we, we compare this proposed algorithm with the central benchmark algorithm including a state of algorithm in the literature. So basically, which is the, uh, the algorithm proposed in, in your group and which didn't consider the, which, which is also based on the three-step procedure, but didn't consider um, more uh, uh, states such as, uh, such as demand and fare, uh, uh, trip fare and so on. And we also compare our pro proposed algorithm to, a, a, to an MPC approach which serves as an Oracle approach that provides a performance upper bound and the uh, other A to C approaches with other neural network architectures. And we also consider a zero shot benchmark that directly applies a model trained on another data set. And the evaluation of this zero, zero shot benchmark shows the transferability of the proposed approach. And let's, let's look at the results. So first, comparing the proposed algorithm with the state-of-art algorithm and the model predict predictive control, we can see that the proposed algorithm can yield quasi-optimal performance. 
and which will significantly outperforms the, the state of our art algorithm. So this is because we consider more states. And second, comparing this graph neural network architecture with two commonly used architecture, um, the multi-layer perception and the convolutional, uh, conv convolutional neural network, we can see that the graph neural network architecture can also improve the performance of this A to C approach by more than 12%. And third, by evaluating the zero shot model trained on, a, on a, another data set, we can also obtain satisfactory performance. This shows the transferability of the proposed approach. And so far, we have presented some of my uh, our works on um, mobility and demand systems enabled by autonomous vehicles. And here are some future directions we, we are considering. So the first thing, first part is to consider uh, multiple ride sharing companies. Um, so here, um, we may not uh, we may have the interactions, uh, the, the choice of passengers between uh, different ride sharing companies, but we also have the choice of drivers between different ride sharing companies, and they'll be competing with each other, which, with each other, and this would make uh, the Stalkerberg game or um, make the game theoretic anal analytics more complicated. And the second part, we're interested in considering endogenous traffic congestion. This would be very um, uh, interesting if the uh, fleet of, uh, of autonomous vehicles constitute a relatively high percentage of the entire traffic on the road. And in this case, the routing of the, uh, of the mobility on demand vehicles would constitute a large impact on the traffic system. And third, we would like to consider the transferability between different cities so that we can train um, one model and apply on, on other cities with minimal training. And in the second part, in the second part, I would like to talk about some of our works um, on the privacy preserving mechanisms for mobility systems. Um, in transportation systems, we always have a conflict between observability, meaning that uh, how much information we can obtain from the transportation systems and the privacy risks. The development in big data has brought with it a rich and real-time data sets, such as data from the road sens roadside sensors, connected and automated vehicles, um, the operational data of mobility providers, and some uh, user survey data. And these data sets can drastically improve the, of, of the observability of the transportation systems and thus have the potential to significantly improve traffic operations. However, these data sets can also impose privacy risks. And these data sets can might leak information on people's location mobility patterns. For example, if a large fleet of autonomous vehicles belonging to a specific mobility provider uh, is moving around the entire city, the mobility operator might be able to monitor the activities within the city using the sensors installed on the autonomous vehicles so that this mobility provider would, would certainly be able to monitor the, uh, the trace of many passengers within the city. And on the other hand, if the mobility provider is to share some of its operational data to traffic authority, for example, to improve the traffic system, and this data might also disclose some information on the operation of, uh, of this mobility provider. For example, some specifics of their algorithms. And one natural solution is the data uh, anonymization, <clears throat> but this can also be problematic because attackers will, will, will be able to re-identify people in data sets by a cross refer, by, by, <clears throat> by look, uh, looking at some kind of uh, external information. And this is what, what, what has happened in the New York data, uh, New York data taxi data set. For example, if by any chance we know that someone leaves a particular region or region at a particular time, and then by looking at the data, it is very likely that, that we can re-identify re re this person and further find out his destination with a fare or like the tips he pays to the driver. This is because the mobility data is typically quite sparse so that there wouldn't be many passengers who leave a certain origin at a particular time. Or alternatively, 
if some neighborhoods have a relatively uh, low number of residents, and then we, we may also significantly, sh significantly shrink, uh, shrink the range of the persons if we know the origin of, or, the, or the destination of the trip. I, um, however, to the best of our knowledge, uh, the research on the privacy, the, the privacy related research in transportation is still quite limited, especially from the methodological perspective. Um, so here we consider a simple case as the data exchange between mobility provider and the municipal authority. And the, the, the mobility provider uh, aims to provide data on, on, on its operational information, such as um, the trip request, uh, such, such as some, some information related to the trip, such as trip request time and the trip trajectories, which also include the pickup and drop off location and pickup and drop off time. And some information on the pricing, such as the trip fare and the wage paid to the drivers and some property of the vehicles. For example, like the colors and the, uh, the energy type and so on. And the mobility provider will send those information to the municipal authority so that the municipal authority can make, it make some decisions on the transportation system. For example, uh, the municipal authority might want to make some decisions to improve some kind of infrastructure. For example, building some new roads within this transportation network. Or they, are, they might also be interested in um, uh, designing some prices uh, for, for uh, uh, designing the congestion prices to uh, manage the traffic within the city. Or the municipal authority might also be interested in to perform some kind of regulation check, compliance check to the mobility provider to see if they, um, they are compliant to, to certain regulations. For example, one type of regulation could be the equity in terms of waiting time. For example, like the, the, the average waiting time within this region and within this region, whether they differ significantly or not. So, um, and our goal is to design a protocol satisfying three conditions. First, the, the, the municipal authority can, is able to make optimal decision based on the, da the data provided by a bad mobility provider. And the second, the mobility provider should be able to uh, protect the privacy of its users. And the third, the mobility provider will not be able to strategically modify the data to achieve better, better benefits. So the first two conditions are quite intuitive because we want to make optimal decisions without sacrificing privacy. And for the third condition, it is in fact likely that the mobility provider will benefit from modifying the data. For example, if they want to hide some of their misconductings so that the provider and the mobility provider, uh, so that the municipal authority is not able to detect that. Or they might also be more inclined to report more demand if they feel that having some additional road can be beneficial. Therefore, we want this protocol to be able to eliminate strategic behavior of the mobility provider in terms of reporting data. And what are commonly used today are, are non-interactive protocols. So where the mobility provider will directly share the data or a modified version of the data, for example, some aggregated version to the, to the municipal authority. However, directly sharing of the data will certainly sacrifice, uh, sacrifice the privacy of the users and sharing a modified version of the data will certainly sacrifice the optimality of the traffic of the municipal authority. And on the other hand, uh, existing interactive protocols assume both parties are trustworthy or rely on a, trust, a trusted third party. However, this is not the case in this setting. For example, many of the protocols, <coughs> uh, the existing protocols are, are based on uh, differential privacy, which uses some, uh, some random uh, responses to high user specific information. And for each query, the data collectors might can provide some ran randomized responses uh, so that the two data sets, which differ in only one uh, entry will produce some statistically indistingu indistinguishable outputs. Um, so, so in this sense, 
the mobility provider can arbitrarily uh, can uh, strategically choose this uh, randomness in order to achieve a better benefit. So to address the issue with this uh, non-interactive protocol, we propose an uh, interactive protocol based on multi-party computation. And in this protocol, the municipal authority will outsource the, uh, the decision-making process to the mobility provider so that the mobility provider doesn't have to share the original data. And then what the mobility authority needs to do is to design the protocol such that the decision uh, such that the decision is the optimal decision calculated from the original data. And there will be two mechanisms to ensure this. And the first mechanism is uh, through a zero knowledge proof, which is a three step procedure. So in the first step, uh, the mobility provider will, will, use, will, will use its original data to uh, produce a data identifier. Uh, that is a commitment and, and then send this commitment to the uh, municipal authority. And such commitment will rely on a cryptographic hash so that it, uh, there are a lot of uh, very nice properties. So first it is confidential, meaning that it doesn't review any information of the data used to generate this commitment. And second, it can enable the, mobility, uh, the, uh, the municipal authority to, uh, to certify later that the result is actually coming from uh, the, the original data. And in the second step, the municipal authority will, will send the, the data query to the mobility provider. And, and then in the third step, the mobility provider will send this response with a zero knowledge proof. And this, uh, the, the municipal authority can then uh, use use this, uh, the, the response and the zero knowledge proof to check whether the response is consistent with this identifier. And uh, in this case, the, the municipal authority will, up, will only accept the message if the decision was computed properly from the same data that was used to generate uh, the, ident the identifier. And if the identifier was reported honestly. And so how do we ensure that the mobility provider wants to be honest in the first place to report this identifier? Because the mobility provider can actually use a falsified data to generate this identifier and then use the falsified data through the entire process. And in this case, the, 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 the municipal authority wouldn't be able to detect that. So here we would um, uh, utilize some external evidence the first type of evidence is a rider witness. So after, after each trip, a rider will receive a kind of receipt from the, uh, the mobility provider. And in this case, the, the, the municipal authority will encourage the riders to request the proof from the mobility provider that their right is included in the original computation of this data identifier. So basically, um, their information is included in the data set, which the, the, the mobility provider uses to report to the municipal authority. And if the mobility provider is not able to provide such a proof, then this writer, writer witness verification would fail. And in this case, uh, the municip municipal authority would charge a huge fine for this mobility provider. And some of this fine can certainly also go to the writers so that the writers are incentivized to, uh, to do this. And the second mechanism to ensure that uh, the mob mobility was uh, honest in the first place is uh, using some external roadside detectors. So, um, <clears throat> and, and uh, suppose there are detectors on every road. And in this case, the, um, the mobility provider, uh, the, the municipal authority is able to calculate the total number of vehicles on the road. And, but, but, but of course, the, uh, in, uh, for the privacy reason, the municipal authority may not be access to the raw data of, this, uh, of all the detectors, but he, he will have this uh, access to the, uh, to the total number of vehicles on the road. And then um, 
uh, when, when verifying the original data, uh, the, the mobility provider will compare this uh, the, the, the sum calculated from the external roadside, roadside detectors with the, the sum of the total demand calculated from, uh, from the original data provided by mobility provider. So in, in this case, if the, two, uh, if the two data doesn't match, then this uh, uh, aggregated roadside aud audits would also fail. So here, this writer witness would, would be able to detect the underreported demand and this aggregated roadside audits will be able to detect whether the mobility provider is reporting some additional demand on the road. And so this, um, so far I have also presented uh, the second part of a, a privacy aware mechanism in, for mobility um, systems. And there are some future directions. One, one direction is to, um, incorporate the differential privacy, which is to add some noises to the original data with this uh, crypt uh, cryptographical tools that we proposed. And the, uh, the, the reason is that um, in, in some cases, the mobility provide uh, the municipal authority might want to ask for um, more information from, from the, uh, the, the municipal authority. For example, if, if, if he is doing some kind of real-time control, then in this case, there will be excessively uh, a data, data exchange. So, and those uh, de decisions might also um, leak some information of the of the users. So, so in this case, we might want to uh, want to add some noises to the original data to ensure that the privacy of the users the users are not leaked. And in this, uh, the the second future direction is to uh, identify some implications for the real time control. And so, so that there will be uh, privacy for um, some privacy because of excessive, excessive exchange of data. And there will also be some, uh, some issues with the computation time in terms of the real-time real control. And there will also be some requirements for, for field deployment, and which is basically also involved with the, how the, uh, like the roadside, roadside, uh, roadside detectors and the, the rider witness are uh, deployed, and there will be also also be a direction of the societal implication, for example, in terms of uh, uh, the equity of the uh, of this particle to um, to the mobility systems. So, as a summary, I have pre presented some of my uh, some some of our works on uh, on the operation of future mobility systems, and the, in the first part, we have uh, presented the um, some interactions between um, autonomous vehicles and student mobility with the human driven vehicles. And in the second part, we, we have presented some, uh, some of our privacy aware mechanism uh, in, in, in transportation. And, and in the future, we are also interested in the other types of interactions and also working on this uh, equity problem. And thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you very much, Kaidi, for a great talk. Is there any question from the audience? If yes, just unmute yourself and ask. Um, hi, yeah, thank you very much for, for the talk. Um, now, uh, I was um, looking at the, um, you know, the, the slides where you, you had the uh, graph neural networks, right? So, um, and you know you did the reinforcement learning. You had those three phases, right? So the first phase, where, the first phase where you do the dispatch. Mm -hmm. uh, then I understand that your reinforcement learning is really to try to figure out what should be the distribution, right, uh, yeah. of empty vehicles. And then in the third phase, you send those vehicles to match the distribution to the extent you can, right? Mm -hmm. Now. Um, I understand why you want to do the, um, you know, the learning right in the middle, but um, doesn't your, don't your choices for the first step and the last step kind of affect the overall performance in a sense? Are you over constraining a little bit too much the learning that way? Mm -hmm. or, yeah. or, said you know in uh, in other words you know wouldn't you benefit from learning the other the other pieces as well yeah this is a very good question so actually we also 
we will have done some experiments to evaluate this. So, so, so in terms of the results, actually the first part, the impact of the first part is not very significant. So, and also like for the passenger assignment in many mobility and demand systems, the, the first part of the, the passenger assignment and the rebalancing are also like to a separate process. So, so for that part, it's actually okay. But there is actually some uh, performance reduction because of the last part. So, um, because of this, uh, um, the, the reason is actually in, in the last part, we have uh, restricted the decision variable in ter to, uh, to be comparable to the number of nodes so that uh, we are not actually uh, calculating the, the, the routes. But actually, in the, um, so um, we, in our extension, we're thinking of extending this. So, so basically to remove the final parts or, or just do some modification to relax this a little bit. Um, but, but currently, for, from the results, the, 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 the performance reduction is around like uh, 5% to 6%, to 6%. So that's still uh, tolerable in, in some sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have also a couple of questions uh, regarding the first part of the talk. Um, mm -hmm. In particular, one of the questions is, um, um, have you had some thoughts on how to extend this to consider ride sharing? I think it mm -hmm. would be interesting to see, since there is kind of a debate uh, about ride sharing, where would it help, where not? Uh, wh yeah. What would be the, the step to, to actually bring this to account for ride sharing policies? Uh, so basically, you mean the first part uh, regarding to regarding the uh, the Stalker game framework? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, uh, in terms of ride sharing, we might, uh, so currently we are considering the the um, uh, the just the routes between between uh, OD pair. So if there are ride sharing in this case, we might have this hyper uh, this hyper bar. So so the modeling will, will be, become more complicated, and especially. Um, there could also be more uh, complicated choice of the of the drivers in, in terms of whether they want to take certain passengers or not, and uh, um, yeah, we we haven't really um, going into this direction, but 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 but, but somehow but somehow the um, um, we can leverage some of the existing works on on the ride sharing to analyze this system. So so basically the the, the difference is just between ride sharing and the current. Uh, like uh, the system without ride sharing. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 another connected question was related to, so uh, you were showing the different um, performances depending on the penetration rate. And mm -hmm. uh, at some point you also had penetration rates of 80% or up to 100%. And then I was wondering yeah. also, for instance, shouldn't one there consider endogenous congestion or, or, and I guess this would complicate the model as well, right? So you would, uh, you would yeah, have to true. compute more scenarios for the, for the game, uh, I assume. Yeah, so, so that's true. So, so, so in this case, so, so, uh, so, if, so currently we make this assumption that the percentage of the mobility on demand vehicles will take a very a small percentage of the entire vehicle population. So in this case, the impact of the autonomous vehicles on uh, this mobility and demand vehicles on road is pretty um, is uh, is pretty marginal. So uh, if we actually have a large uh, number, large fleet of uh, mobility and demand vehicles, then um, in this case we need we need to consider the um, the endogenous congestion. So, so in that case, our model will be uh, changed from. Uh, um, we also need to consider the routing between the OD pairs. And, and so, so we also need to consider some, some kind of equilibrium there. So this would make the problem quite complicated. So uh, this is also the reason why we want to extend this work using the reinforcement learning uh, architecture. So um, we hope that some of this uh, endogenous congestion can be learned directly from the reinforcement learning part. Great, and, and I have a final one, which is, um... So for the learning part, you were showing a potential, huge potential benefits of the operation of the system. Yes. Um, and there the question comes for uh, demand, uh, for induced demand, right? If you are, are having a very cool system, then more people will, will uh, use it. So uh, yeah. how could you incorporate elastic demand in the, in the learning pipeline? Or uh, have you done some work on that? Maybe exploratory work? 
Yeah, uh, we, we have. We have thought about this, but we haven't done any exploratory work uh, so far. Um, so, um, so, so basically, for for this, we we are we are thinking of incorporating a demand prediction module, so which will able to be able to capture like some some uh, like operational factors with the uh, to to just predict the demand in the future, uh, because because actually the system operates in real time. So, so the, the, the demand at the, at the current time step can be observed from the request of the users. And so, so the, the only thing that the elastic, elastic demand would impact the system is the demand prediction part. So, so, so if we can incorporate some of this elastic demand uh, module into this uh, uh, demand prediction part, then we, we should be able to uh, somehow solve this problem. Great, thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, I have one question. Go ahead, that's okay. Uh, thank you, Kaidi. Uh, my question is about the last part of the talk. <laughs> and uh, may I ask you to please restate what the issue with uh, equity is that arises with the protocol you are proposing? Um, yeah, yeah, actually, actually, uh, in terms of the uh, the social implement, implement uh, one, it's not really a, actually an issue. So, so one, um, um, one, one goal of this uh, this research is actually to um, use this model to check some some some, uh, some kind of uh, equity issues. Related to the mobility and uh, on-demand on system, the existing mobility on-demand systems. Um, for, for, for example, in, in many of many of those, those existing systems, uh, the, mobi the mobility provider may not be willing to serve particular regions. So that, um, and it is very hard for the uh, municipal, municipal authority to track that. And uh, but with with this uh, with this uh, verifiable. Uh, interactive protocol, we should be able to check whether um, the mobility providers are compliant in terms in terms of some equity requirement or not. And we would like to see how this protocol can, um, maybe it's actually to benefit uh, the, the equity of the users. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think there is a question in the chat. Have you thought of other methods like persistent homology for analyzing patterns of traffic congestion? I think that's a specific one, maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, could, could, you, could you first explain what is the persistent homology? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe uh, Jason Heath can unmute himself. I'm not sure. Maybe it doesn't have a mic. Okay, 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 okay. So um, yeah, in this case, it's actually, um, it should be possible. But, um, but um, one, one way we're actually thinking is there are actually some, some very simple um, traffic models we can also use. But, but, but this uh, topological data analysis could also be um, a potential way looking at this. Yeah. So, so just to be sure, if I get this correctly, in the first part of the work, the one about the Stackelberg game, mm -hmm. having exogenous congestion essentially brings you to the point where you don't need to compute routing strategies, right? Because it's uh, yeah, somehow sure. a, 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 a table where you read out the, the times you need to go from A to B, and you, know, you don't need to optimize for the route choice. Instead, if you have congestion, you should include that piece the, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. So even yeah. with the uh, time varying congestion, we should still be able to calculate the, the, the shortest path just based on the, the, the traffic congestion at the current time. Yeah. Cool. So it doesn't seem there are other questions. If you have more, just, uh, just uh, feel free to reach out to Kaidi. I think you gave your coordinates. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. and. Uh, Good luck for the next steps. I don't know how long are you staying in US. Are are you are there some news around? Or? 
Yeah, I think I'm staying pretty long, I think. Okay, <laughs> then good luck. And uh, thank you again for the talk. Thank you, thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you all for participating. See you all next week for the next autonomy talk. Bye-bye. Thank you.